All right, so we are in the age of reform. And when we left off, if I can get it to work up here, the last thing we talked about was abolitionism. And abolitionism, again, is just that belief that uh, slavery should be abolished. I think y'all are plotting to kill me at this point. Is that your plan? No? Yeah. Well, students are plotting to kill me. Uh, all right. So all of this abolition movement is going to be going on at this time period, but that's not all that's going to happen. The slave owners that are out there are also going to be responding to, to all these actions. Um, there was actually a proposal to legally end slavery. It's defeated by Virginia and some of the other southern states. Um, and then they push through a series of black codes. Let's talk about black codes a little bit. Black codes are laws that apply only to black Americans, uh, only to slaves. And there were lots and lots of restrictions that, that were put in place. We talked about some of these before. But restrictions like it was illegal for, in Virginia, it was illegal for more than three blacks to, to congregate in one spot. Why would that be a rule? Any ideas? Because they may be learning something. Well, that, we don't want them learning. That's a good well, point. Wait, what about if they had a family, like a husband, wife, and kids? No, no. Wanting to escape? You could do stuff if it was work-related, like on the plantation, but you couldn't go out and congregate somewhere, even even when you were free. And the reason why is because they were worried they would organize. That's the key, is organization. And you wonder about why they're so worried about this. But you realize that in this time period, and we don't get into it because it's it's world history, but there was a revolution in Haiti where the slaves rose up and defeated the French and created their own, an independent republic. I mean, Toussaint Louverture overthrew France and became a separate nation. That was in the air, and we are terrified of slave revolts at this time. So. You've got to keep, you've got to have a way of, of controlling it. Um, Virginia also had a law. I keep using Virginia because it was the biggest slave state. Virginia had a law that said that it was okay for you to manumit your slaves. You could free your slaves, but your slaves had had to leave the state. You couldn't free them and, they, and have them stay. So even if you bought your freedom, if some of your family members weren't free, you couldn't stay there with them. You had to you had to leave the state. They didn't want any free blacks around. Uh, there was a lot of movement to try and outlaw slavery. But they put in place the gag rule in Congress. If you don't know what a gag rule is, they said that on the issue of slave trade, that it would not even be allowed to be brought up. They put a they put a gag on it. They made it a crime. For 20 years, you weren't even allowed to bring up the possibility of freeing slaves. That's amazing, if you think about it. They put a rule in place saying that it's so close now that we're not even going to let the vote come up. You can't even talk about it. By the way, gag rules are unconstitutional. But we, didn't, uh, we, we hadn't established that yet at that point. So there's a lot of things happening against this. Women were an interesting place in this time period. Um, there was no national suffrage. I've used this word suffrage before. I keep using it. You need to know it. If you don't know what the word suffrage means, learn it now. Suffrage means the right to vote. It is super, super important. I'm going to tell you a real true story about when I went to college at at SFA, shoot for average, a long time ago. Stephen F. Austin has an area called the Free Speech Territory where you can organize and it's where political speech happens. Well, there was this guy that was a political science major and he did a little bit of a social experiment there. This is on a college campus. He held a sign up there in the free speech area that said, end women's suffrage. Women have suffrage long enough in this country. 
and he had a petition and people were signing it. And they weren't signing it because they thought women shouldn't vote. There were women signing this. And it's because they thought the word suffrage meant to suffer. So they looked at it and they said, I agree, women have suffered long enough. Uh, but So why do you need to know suffrage? Because you might sign the wrong petition, okay? Kind of an important term. Um, that, that, that's a true story from, from way back in... When you were in college, I think? When I was in college, yeah, you know, back in the dark ages. Uh, so women did not have suffrage, but that does not mean that they didn't have power. Frequently, they were the ones that were holding the house together and running the businesses, particularly while the men were out fighting wars or, you know, even in the case of, like, Thomas Jefferson, excuse me, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, while they're, you know, while they're presidents, Dolly Madison's running things, you know. Uh, so, so the women, women still have, still have uh, power in some cases. They couldn't hold public office, but again, you can't hold public office. But does that mean that you're powerless? Think about Anne Hutchison in Rhode Island. Uh, she seemed to have a lot of power. Think about Abigail Adams, who said, "Remember the ladies and fought for women's suffrage." Think about Dolly Madison that. You know, stood up to the English and saved the, uh, the the portrait of Washington and key documents. Women still had these. Uh, you know, had, had had some power if they chose to exercise it. If you were a female at this time period, though, you had very little legal rights. In fact, legally, you were treated as a minor, as a child. What does that mean? That meant that you were the property, essentially. They didn't use the word property, but that that's essentially what it meant. You were the property of your father until you got married and then you became the property of your husband. Women could own property if you were single, but as soon as you got married, that property became the property of your husband. So if your father died and left you some property and then you married, that property then becomes owned by your husband. Yes? Okay, since you say they can own property if they're single yep. until they're married because they're Yep. If husband owns them, why not? If they're single, then it's their dad's land because he owns them then. Well, they do, but what happens if your dad dies? You could inherit land. Uh, the other side of that is, you know, if you're a widow, you could you could inherit your family, your husband's land. You could you could own all that. But if you remarried, it became the property of your new husband. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it, it, it's an interesting place to be if you're a female. It's, it's kind of a strange spot. And especially strange because women outnumbered men. Women were about 52% of, uh, of the population at this time. So there's more of them and less rights. That's hard to imagine. Until you start thinking about it and you realize that today women are about 52% of the electorate. Most most of our voters are women. And you look around and go, you, you would expect you would expect as a sociologist that, that we would have a female president by now. We have more women voters, uh, but we haven't. So you can see we're having, you know, having the the power of numbers is not always the same as having the power. And that's kind of the example I'm trying to get here. In most states, women were not even allowed to attend high school. Uh, you could go to school, you could get your basics, but it was genu generally believed that higher math was impossible for women. Um, and that's kind of that's kind of hung on with us from this time period. Now today we know that's not true. Women outscore men on math score math tests all the time now. But throughout most of history, that's been a hanger on. I remember back in the 90s, there was a Barbie doll that got in a lot of trouble because the Barbie doll spoke, and when you did it, it said, math is hard. That was in the 1990s, okay? So you realize that, that, that some of these things have long-reaching effects, okay? So how do you fight against these traditional women's roles? There were, uh, there were people that fought hard. 
There were people like uh, the women suffragists. A suffragist is somebody that's fighting for the right to vote. So uh, call them sister suffragists. The, these people got together at a place called Seneca Falls, New York, where they drafted the Seneca Falls Declaration, or sometimes called the Declaration of Sentiments, which is essentially a declaration of independence for women. And if you read it, it's not genius. It's not genius. It's largely the Declaration of Independence. But they took the male nominative sounds out and replaced them with male and female. Like, for instance, where it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They said that all people are created equal. It's that simple. By men, do they mean everybody? Or just men? It, it depends. Thomas Jefferson said, when he said that, he meant mankind, which is all people. And that's what it's generally been, been interpreted as. But if you look at the time period, clearly they didn't mean women. They didn't have the right to vote. So uh, I, I don't know. Um, this Seneca Falls Declaration was read, was, was kind of uh, ran by these two people. Lucretia Mott, what a great name, Lucretia. Write that one down because that would be a great name for your kid. Uh, and Elizabeth Cady, Stan Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, they were some tough broads. In a time period when they told women to sit down and shut up, these girls refused to do that. They stood up and they said, we have rights, and they fought for them to the extent of being thrown in jail sometimes. Y'all heard of Susan B. Anthony, right? She was one of these women a little later, but she's still in this, in this era. Susan B. Anthony voted illegally in New York State for 14 years. Seven election cycles. 14 years for seven election cycles, she showed up, stared down the person at the ballot box and said, give me a ballot. And they took one look at her and went, I think I'll give you a ballot. And she voted illegally. Okay? Because she said, I have a right. This is the movement that's out there. It seems to kind of be in the air that women should have rights. And Oberlin College, Oberlin College became the first university in the country to admit women in 1833. Uh, Oberlin College is still around. Uh, today it's not. A, it went for a while where it was Oberlin Female Seminary, but it's, it's now just Oberlin College. Lots of people there. Uh, terrible basketball team. But other than that, they're pretty good. They're a pretty good college. Geneva Medical College in 1849 uh, admitted Elizabeth Blackwell to their program. She became the first female in this country to, uh, to be a licensed medical doctor. That's pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. Uh, Mount Holyoke Female Seminary. Mount Holyoke also is still around today. Uh, pretty good, pretty good uh, college. Antoinette Brown Blackwell attends Mount Holyoke, where she gets a degree in divinity, basically becomes a preacher. So all of this stuff is happening. I've already talked about Susan B. Anthony, so I'm not going to go into her again. But all of this stuff has been happening at the same time. It's got to be an exciting time period to be a female, okay? Where everything is changing. Does that mean it's an easy time period to be a female? No. There's nothing easy about it. Nothing worth doing, is it? Again, we're in this time period of reform where we start looking at, at, at new, new ways to change things. And we had a lot of health reform at this time, too. Like, for instance, uh, there was movements to give rights to the blind. Now, that may sound silly to us. They were going, of course the blind have rights. But they didn't really have rights back then. In fact, if you were seriously injured, if you were blind or you were deaf, you were put in an institution to be cared for. You were put in the same place that the crazy people were. Because we didn't have anything else for you. There were just there was nothing out there for you. And it was believed that you couldn't you just couldn't survive. Well, Samuel Gridley Howe says, that's not right. We shouldn't be treating people as mentally ill because they've lost their sight. They're not stupid, they're hurt. And he started developing 
new and better ways for people to uh, be able to care for themselves. Things like the like Braille was developed this time. We don't know what Braille is, right? Mm -hmm. Y'all seen this before that where, where you can read by, by filling a series of dots on, on a sheet of paper. Each one means a different letter and you can read through the fingertips. At Chick-fil-A we have menus that are Braille. You know what always disturbs me is that the drive through ATM has Braille on it. Are you serious? <laughs> what? I want you to think about that for a minute. The drive through ATM machine has Braille on it. What blind person decides, I think I'll just drive through here. You know, it's just bizarre. Anyway, so Braille was developed. Also, the manual alphabet. Now, this is a, a, an early version of sign language. This eventually becomes AC, ASL, American Sign Language. But at this point, it's just the manual alphabet. It's the way of speaking with your hands. Uh, it's not quite as advanced as, as, as the modern one, uh, but, but, it, but it was out there. It was a, a little more advanced than the hand and arm signals you might use while driving and somebody cuts you off in traffic. But other than that, it, was, it, it, it wasn't a whole. I see you smiling back there. I suspect you do that. Uh, one of the most famous of these is, is a lady named Helen Keller. Again, she's going to come into the class again a little later on, uh, but she's an example of, of these people that, that were blind. She was blind, deaf, and dumb, uh, and, and manages to, to, to go on and become successful. Hey, Alberts. Yes? Our thing just said five minutes remaining. There is so some... probably fixing to cut off. Is that, is that Brooklyn? Yes. There is something wrong on your end then, as far as timing goes. Uh, I would, we probably don't have more than about 10 minutes left, so if it shuts off, I'll, I'll post it up there, okay? Okay, no. All right. Uh, it was also a time period for, for rights for the mentally ill, where we started saying, just because you're mentally ill doesn't mean that you're a criminal, because that's how we were treating a lot of the insane. They were being treated... If you, were, uh, if you were mentally ill or you were criminally insane, you went to the same institution. Everybody's in Arkham Asylum with, with the Joker, okay? It's not a good place to be. You've got you to gotta find some, some way to do this. Well, Dorothea Dix is the one that comes through and says, no, we need to do something else. We need to, we need to have a hospital for these people. Instead of just locking them up, they started caring for them. That's a change. Uh, the rights for children... This is kind of the beginning of childhood. Now, that sounds silly. But guys, before about 1840, there was no such thing as childhood. You were a baby, and then you were doing a you were a small man doing a man's work. Okay? There was none of this childhood thing. As soon as you were old enough to do a day's work, you were expected to work. That's why we had eight and ten year olds in the mines working. Okay? But we started looking around and saying, no. Children need to have rights, particularly orphans, because orphan, orphan children was a big, big problem at this time here. So we developed things like almshouses that were out there. They were kind of like orphanages where, where, you could get, where kids could go get off the street and they could be cared for and be given an education. We developed what we call houses of refuge, which was places where if you were just temporarily homeless, they would take care of the kids. Uh, maybe your parents lost their job and they can't afford to care for you. They would just take care of you for a little while. We developed something called the Children's Aid Society. A guy named Charles Loring Brace came up with this, where he looked around at the cities and he said, we have a big juvenile delinquency problem. The kids are out of control. What we need to do is take them out of the cities, take them out to the country, and make them go to work on a farm for a little while. So they take them in the summertime, and they'd go out and they'd learn to bale hay and work with horses and cows and fix fences. And they would learn all this. And the thought was, when we sent you back, you would have a respect for, for hard work and you'd have a skill. These aren't bad ideas. And they worked. By the way, if you, anybody ever seen the, the old Disney movie, The Rescuers? Yes. You know, the, the mice with the Rescue Aid Society? That was, the, that was based on... Charles Loring Brace and the Children's Aid Society. That's what that movie's based on. And they turned them into mice and it was silly. But that was kind of kind of the idea. Remember they were going to rescue the little girl that was being abused as an orphan? Well, that's, that's what was going on. 
got to get her out of there. So some of those old Disney movies did have a, you know, kind of a point to them. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite picture of all time. This is a real photograph during the time period of prohibition where they were fighting to make alcohol illegal. And all of these women got together and they said, we'll, we know how to stop men from drinking. We'll make this ad. And they all took a picture and it says, lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. Well, I'm telling you, if I, my lips had to touch any of those, I'd need a stiff drink first. It's not going <laughs> to work real well for me. But that was a real ad and a real campaign that was out there. It was called Temperance. Temperance was the movement to end drunkenness, while Prohibition was the movement to outlaw all alcohol. They were closely related. But why would they want to do this? Why was it related to the women's rights movement? Well, it was related to the women's rights movement because it was genuine, generally believed that men were getting drunk and abusing their wives. Now, did that happen sometimes? Yeah. Does it still happen sometimes? Yep. But they thought the two were so closely linked that they were trying to make alcohol illegal. And they were successful. They actually did manage to outlaw alcohol for a few years. For a few years. And this time period, they outlawed it state by state. But later on, there's actually going to be a constitutional amendment outlawing it completely. The American Temperance Union was founded at this time period with the purpose of, uh, of, of trying to get alcohol illegal. Anybody ever heard of a lady named Molly Hatchett? Molly Hatchett was this, uh, it was a really good band in the 19th. Welcome to the conferencing system. To join a conference, that you may use the far end camera controls on your remote. Please enter the conference number followed by the pound key or press star to create a new conference. Wes Sabine, did I lose you too? No, we're still here. Okay. All right, I think that's I think that's Brooklyn that's coming across doing that. Okay. It's probably gonna keep talking to us for a minute, so I'm gonna try to enter the conference number followed by the pound key or press star to create a new conference. All right, let me see if I can just get past this.